Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire again, folks. Now we're working our way towards Bridlington, seaside town. And on the way to Bridlington on the A614, you will have passed through this place before. I am guaranteeing you that. This place has got a big hall and a church as well that's equally historic and lots of other little features that definitely make this an East Riding location. This is the beautiful Burton Agnes. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Burton Agnes, enclosed fort of Agnes de Percy. This week in the East Riding we have another Burton. They like their Burtons up here, don't they? This one is Burton Agnes, named in honour of Agnes de Percy. Who was that, you ask? Well, you'll soon find out. Burton Agnes consists of a main village as well as two hamlets, namely Gransmore and Thornholme, and the whole thing is midway between Driffield and Bridlington on and around the A614. The largest and most well-known landmark in the place is Burton Agnes Hall. Together with the Norman Manor House just yards away from it, they form a massive local tourist attraction. From April to October, Burton Agnes becomes a tourism hotspot. The hall is an Elizabethan manor house built by Sir Henry Griffith in the early 1600s, whilst the Norman Manor House dates back to 1173. Both are Grade 1 listed. As you might expect, Burton Agnes is an estate village as a result. It's been in the hands of the same family since the Norman House was first built and occupied by Roger de Stuteville. After passing down through the generations via the Griffith family who emigrated from Wales, it now finds itself in the hands of the Burton Agnes Preservation Trust. It all sounds very complicated, but trust me, it will all become clear. Let's have a walk around and take it all in. To understand Burton Agnes, you first have to understand its history. There are several names linked to the village and there are two main buildings to discuss. Burton Agnes Hall and the original Norman Manor House built in 1173 by Roger de Stuteville. Since that time, the manor has never been sold. It's descended by marriage to the Griffith family whose principal estate was in Staffordshire. In 1599, Henry Griffith was appointed to the Council of the North and wishing to have a base closer to York where it was based, he built Burton Agnes Hall between 1601 and 1610. The estate later passed to Sir Francis Boynton of Barmston and descended via the Boynton line until 1899. That's when the Wickhams married into the family. The last Wickham Boynton, Marcus, died without issue in 1989 after having established the Burton Agnes Hall Preservation Trust. The estate was then settled on the Cunliffe Listers, Boynton descendants, and although open to the public, the hall remains privately owned by them to this day. We start our walk on St Martin's Drive, a dead-end street off the road to Rudston. At its very end is Burton Agnes Playground, separate from the main sports and recreational area which is further around this route. 
With a decent amount of play equipment and a nice green open space, it's perfect for the locals. And Burton Agnes isn't just about the tourism offered by its most attractive landmarks. It has a modest number of residential properties, a lot of which are centred around St Martin's Drive, St Martin's Close and the A614. On Rudston Road there's a school. Education here can be traced back to 1540, and this is at least the third to the village's name. Although extended and modernised these days, the original part of Burton Agnes C of E dates from 1871. It was built by Sir Henry Boynton, who at the time owned Burton Agnes Hall. As you approach the A614 you may notice this sign. We're in another part of the East Riding that cyclists love, so you'll likely see a few here. If two wheels aren't your thing, how about four? At this bus stop you can get the number 121 to Bridlington. The A614 has the Blue Bell on its route. This was formerly a hotel known to many travellers along the road to Bridlington. As a pub it was still serving pints until very recently, but now it's all about accommodation only. It's been turned into a huge holiday let which can sleep up to 52 people. Next we find a working blacksmith's forge. This is DC Blacksmiths which began in 1995, the brainchild of self-taught metal worker David Cooper. His forge was originally located in Bridlington, but since 2018 it's taken pride of place here in what was an old joiner's shop. Before we go any further there's the small matter of the parish notice board, so tick off Burton Agnes everyone, we're down to 32. Next we start to make our way downhill towards a crossroads in the village centre. Sitting within the dip at the bottom of this hill is Burton Agnes's Mere. It's yet another picturesque pond, typical of those found all over the East Riding. This one has suffered terribly in the past thanks to a combination of dry summers and abstraction of water elsewhere on the walls. Here though it has to be said, it looked fabulous. Historically Burton Agnes had both a windmill and a watermill which both ground corn. The watermill once stood next to the pond but now all that remains is the millbeck and the sound of its rushing water. They would both stopped working by the 1850s but when in use they belonged to the manor. Also by the pond is an old chapel which has now been turned into a house. This was a Wesleyan chapel and it was built in 1857. It's another village feature attributed to that man Sir Henry Boynton. The path beside it has brought us full circle around the Mere. We're back to the A614, the Bridlington Road. Over the last century the character of the village has been affected by the increasing volume of traffic on this. Improvements were made in 1939 by demolishing some old almshouses and later the A614 was widened, effectively cutting the village in half. One landmark that survived those alterations is the War Memorial. With 18 names on it in total, this cross remembers those from Burton Agnes, Thornhome and Haysthorpe. Next we go up Shady Lane, so named thanks to its thick canopy of trees, making it appear very dark. At the top of the hill there's a car park, one of the few around Burton Agnes Hall. The main one though is around the back. Towering over it is a magnificent building but this isn't the hall, this is just its gatehouse. With its four octagonal corner turrets this could be considered as impressive as the hall itself. It was built in 1610 by Robert Smithson, nine years after construction work began on the hall itself. It's an excellent example of Jacobean architecture. The coat of arms of James I is set above its central archway. The jewel in the Burton Agnes crown, and some say in the entire East Riding, is of course the hall, but it's not open at the moment because it's winter. It's only open between April and October. All these buildings around the edge of Maypole Hill and Shady Lane belong to the hall and its grounds. Well, not quite all. This white building nearby is the 19th century old rectory, another listed building. And given we're near that it stands to reason we're also in the vicinity of the church. Indeed we are, it's hiding away behind this rather large tree near its entrance. Dedicated to St Martin, this was built in around 1100 to replace an earlier church that stood on the same site. Much altered and added to over the centuries, St Martin's contained some curious features. These include an alabaster tomb on which rest the effigies of Sir Walter Griffith and his wife. He also has a rather macabre memorial on the north wall. 
Among other monuments is one to Robert Wilberforce, the son of William Wilberforce the Reformer, who was once the Rector. There's also a tomb chest decorated with carvings of bones and skulls. Now before the hall came to exist there was of course an original Norman manor house. Dating from 1173 we can see it from the churchyard, although the view is somewhat hindered by a high wall. It's considered to be one of the finest surviving examples of a Norman manor house anywhere in the UK. It's also a great example of an undercroft, basically a chalk house that was later encased in 18th century brickwork. Both it and Burton Agnes Hall are Grade 1 listed buildings and they've been open to the public since 1949. Here's the main car park for all their visitors. Once through the car park we're back to Rudston Road and the sports area is next on our hit list. These playing fields are the base for both the village's football and cricket teams. There's a small bowls rink near the football pitch too and Bridlington Archery Club also use these facilities. Rudston Road has some hidden bits of history. This road was once the site of a gallows. It was located close to the parish boundary, well out of the way of anyone. Ironically, the cemetery is also nearby. I wonder if any of the condemned were interred here. As we make our way back to the start down Rudston Road, there's just one question left to answer. How did Burton Agnes get its name? Well, in the 12th century there were three ladies named Agnes who could have given the village its distinctive suffix. It's believed though to be Agnes the daughter of Geoffrey Baynard, who married the overlord of the manor, Robert de Bruss. It's likely Geoffrey Baynard was the man renting the manor from the king in 1086. Here we are back on St Martin's Drive. That's been a lovely little wonder all in all. Okay, so we've finished the walk around Burton Agnes, but we're not quite done with the parish yet because there are two other settlements within its boundaries. These are Thornholme and Gransmore, and they're both very, very small places. That's where the car comes in. Let's do some filming while driving. Blink and you'll miss them, the road to Gransmore features a level crossing and the former Burton Agnes railway station, both on the Scarborough to Hull line. The station closed at the same time as the one we met at Lowthorpe on the 5th of January 1970. The most notable thing about the line at this point was an accident back in 1947 when a truck carrying German prisoners of war collided with a train. In 2013 a plaque was unveiled at the site in remembrance of those who died. After heading south for a good two miles, we're now in Gransmore. This was formerly a township in the parish of Burton Agnes before it broke away in 1866 and formed its own. We've heard that before. It was reabsorbed into the modern boundaries in 1935. Gransmore is basically one street, and a small one at that, containing no more than about 30 houses in total. It has no communal facilities other than its phone box. However, Gransmore is popular with holiday makers. There's a couple of holiday cottages here, as well as a big caravan park at Gransmore Lodge, ideal for trips to the seaside. And if you stay there, you'll likely pass through Thornholme on the way to the sea. This is the next village along the A614 towards Bridlington. It's another of those blink and you'll miss it kind of places. Thornholme was once owned by the St Quintin family, the very same who we met in Harpham. Earthworks in the area suggest the village was once larger than it is today, but its best known feature these days is a petrol station, often used by all those holiday makers. That's it folks, I'll see you down the road in the next one. Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.